Hello, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with Professor of Psychology, Dr. Ellen Langer, to discuss the links between mind, body, and health. Ellen earned her PhD at Yale University in social and clinical psychology and joined the faculty at Harvard University in 1977. In 1981, she became the first woman ever to be tenured in psychology at Harvard. The Langer Lab conducts research on health, happiness, decision-making, education, business, and culture, all through the lens of mindfulness. Because of this research, among other honors, Dr. Langer has earned three Distinguished Scientist Awards, the STATS Award for Unifying Psychology, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Liberty Science Genius Award. She is considered the mother of mindfulness and has written five books on the topic, starting with her bestseller, Mindfulness, and her newest book, The Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health, which was the focus of our conversation. Ellen's philosophical take on mindfulness is very unique and deviates quite a bit from the mainstream take on mindfulness that is typically discussed in conjunction with meditation. While traditional definitions of mindfulness center around being aware of the contents of conscious awareness, Ellen broadly describes mindfulness as actively noticing new things, relinquishing preconceived mindsets, and acting on the new observations. She emphasizes the importance of being curious and playful when navigating everyday situations, and that this posture is the key to unlocking our best selves. Her work draws some pretty bold conclusions on the link between our mindsets and measurable physical outcomes, including aging. Specifically, she suggests that our thoughts can have causal impacts on our physical health, and that the reason why this can occur is because our default way of conceptualizing the mind and body as separate entities is incorrect. Rather, the mind and body should be thought of as a single unified concept. While my personal take on this line of research differs slightly from Ellen's, our conversation forced me to rethink all of the opportunities we have to shift our perspective in order to improve our subjective and possibly objective well-being. I also felt the urge to re-examine the various ways my thoughts might be limiting my potential when pursuing personal goals. If you're in the market for a refreshing new perspective on life, this is the episode for you. Enjoy. Okay, today I am joined by Ellen Langer. Thank you so much. It's a real treat that I get a chance to speak with you today. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, So your new book is entitled The Mindful Body, and you spend a, a, a large portion of the book talking about the relationship between uh, mindfulness and health, both physical and mental health. And so we're going to spend a lot of time digging into these links. Uh, but before we do that, um, it seems as though your definition of mindfulness. Yeah, is... people need to understand. Yeah. Okay, what, what does she mean by that? All right. Well, <laughs> first is, of all, yeah. oftentimes mm-hmm. people think when they hear mindfulness, they think of meditation. And meditation is not mindfulness. Meditation is a practice you engage in, hopefully to result in post meditative mindfulness. Um, mindfulness, as we study it, is not a practice. Um, it is a way of being that derives from an understanding that everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. Hence, uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. Now, one way of understanding mindlessness is um, a way of seeing people as being frequently in error, but rarely in doubt. Everybody thinks they know but they can't know for the reason I just gave. And a way you find out that you don't know and the way to become mindful is simply notice new things about the things you think you know. So oftentimes, uh, um, Ryan, I might start in a lecture and ask, ask the audience, how much is two plus two, one plus one? 
It would also be the case for two plus. Uh-huh. How much is one plus? Because this is something that everybody knows that they know. So how much is it? One plus one is two. If I believe. That's right. Okay. But not always, you see. If you were to add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. One pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry is one. Uh, one watt of chewing gum plus one watt of chewing gum is one. My gosh, in the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as a more often as it does. Now, so this is the thing we know the best. And we got it wrong. And so um, what I would assume, once you become more mindful, so now, Ryan, it's not likely, but after we're finished today, somebody says, hey, Ryan, how much is one plus one? You're not going to just mindlessly say two. You're going to look to the context to see what you might answer. And then you're probably going to say it could be two, which is very different. Okay, from it is two. And um, so when you're when you're mindful, you don't close yourself off to information. Um, When you're mindful, you recognize that everything can be understood in many different ways. And the process of understanding it, you know, as even looking outside at the trees, you know, and noticing. So I started to paint when I was about 50, so a long time ago. And before that, if you said to me, what color are leaves? I'd say green, except in the fall. But, you know, when you start painting, you start looking, my gosh, there are hundreds of different shades of green. Right. All right. So um, what is the point of that? Where was I going with that? Um, that um, when when you're there for the event, and sadly, the research shows us that most of us are mindless almost all the time. When you're mindless, you're not there, but you're not there to know you're not there. So now I'm noticing all these different greens, the neurons are firing, and we find that mindfulness is literally and figuratively enlivening. We did studies ages ago where we gave old people um, uh, exercises and being mindful, and they live longer. Mm -hmm. Um, It turns out that almost everything, you know, 45 years is a long time to be doing research, lots of opportunity uh, to test the effects of mindfulness on almost everything. And so we find not just that it's good for your health, not just that it extends your life, but when you are mindful, people know that you're mindful, you you light up in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so people, when they're being mindful, are seen as more charismatic. Um, When people are mindful, other people trust them more. When people are mindful, uh, your relationships improve. Why would your relationships improve? Well, because uh, rather than, so let's say you and I are together, Ryan, I'm a little too old for you, but nevertheless, for argument's sake, that, um, you know, right now, I think that you're... um, uh, wishy-washy, you know, you keep changing your mind, you're inconsistent. Okay. Now, if I were mindful, I'd recognize that nobody is inconsistent from their own perspective. So what does it mean that you're inconsistent? From your perspective, you're being flexible. Ah, you don't like me because you think I'm so gullible, which I am, I'm a pushover. Um, but from my perspective, it's because I'm trusting. I don't like you because you're so boring, Mm -hmm. but that's because you're stable. So it turns out each and every, every single negative way of understanding ourselves or other people has an alternative, positive, um, uh, positively valenced alternative that's just as strong. And when you're mine. Yeah. Now, I'm just to say, so when you're mindful, you see, you have the choices. I can see you as impulsive or spontaneous. And, you know, uh, when I'm mindless, I will just dislike you for being impulsive or perhaps just like you for being spontaneous. So uh, w- when I hear you uh, bring up all these examples, you know, the, f- the first thing that comes to mind is relates to what we know about how humans uh, think about situations in general. And what I mean by that is we often, uh, anytime we encounter a new situation, the first thing that we're going to have is sort of a, a feeling or an intuition. It kind of, this is relates to uh, the system one and system two work, um, which talks about how, you know, humans have sort of an automatic well, side yes. of their I mean, brain so and we've a been doing calculated side. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about mindlessness and mindfulness for many years prior, decades prior to System 1 and System 2. Right. But what's right. interesting is that both System 1 and System 2 are mindless. Okay, mindfulness, as we study it, is energy begetting. It's what you're doing when you're having fun. It's easy. It's not using limited resources. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, so if you were to um, add 5,026 by 42, that's system two, you know, because nothing is changing in that equation. Um, you know, so when you're doing anything where there's a certain amount of tedium, you know, that, uh, that system two, when you're having fun, when you're listening to, I don't know, uh, a comedian and you're laughing, you're being mindful. If you were going to come to visit me, having never been to my house, you wouldn't have to practice being mindful. You'd walk in, you're curious. What is she reading? What, you know, what works yeah. of art are on the walls? Is she neat? You know, what, whatever things you care about. Mm -hmm. So it's not a practice. It's just realizing that this is new. And so the information that I'm giving you now is that what is old is also new because it has changed. So relationships become stale, right? Oh, we've been together for 20 years. I know everything. I finished your sentences. You finish mine. And we act as if we're the same people we were 20 years ago, but we're not. And when you start noticing all the ways the person is new, gee, you know, your hair's a different color, whatever, the person you're noticing feels seen and relationships improve. Now, uh, the major, one of the major parts of the mindful body is that um, uh, if you put the mind and body back together, which is what I suggest, and the book is about mind-body unity. It's one thing, right? And if it's one thing, it's not that they're connected. They're one thing. And as one thing, wherever you put one, you're putting the other. So we do lots of studies where we put the mind in unusual places and take the measurements from the body. So the first of these was the counterclockwise study. This was, um, we did this ages ago, where we retrofitted a retreat to 20 years earlier, and we had old men live there as if they were their younger selves, talking about the past as if things were just unfolding now. In a period of time as short as a week, their hearing improved, their vision improved, their strength improved, and they look noticeably younger, all without any medical intervention. So now in the mindful body, I have a host of new studies, um, just as dramatic you know, as that one. I'll give an example of just one of them, but there are so many. Um, so we inflict a wound. Now I'm not a sadist, and even if I were they wouldn't let me do the study if I'm inflicting <laughs> big wound. So it's a minor wound, but it's right. still a wound. And we have people in um, three groups of people and they're in front of a clock individually. Unbeknownst to them, the clock is rigged. So that means for one group, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For one group, another group, it's going half as fast as real time. So time is rushing by, time is creeping by, or the clock is giving real time. What we're asking is, will that wound heal based on real time or based on perceived time, which in this case would be clock time. And what we find is it's based on perceived time. We have people in a sleep lab, they wake up, they think they got two hours more or two hours fewer sleep than they actually got. Biological and cognitive functioning follow perceived sleep. We have so many of these sorts of studies that um, it's hard not to um, accept the mind body unity notion. And so yeah. for those specific examples, because um, they were th those were a couple you just mentioned a couple of the more powerful examples that I recall from reading the book, um, especially the, the sleep study one um, in general, when you see these kind of profound uh, effects where it's, it's not, it, it goes against what someone would, would predict, you know, you, someone right, would say, right. you know, what, what does your perceived sleep have to do with your required seven or eight hours? So, um, what, what yeah, do you okay, think so, is going on yeah, no, that would oh, generate that? I'm telling you, Ryan, I have been asked this question in one way or the other for so many years. And the question all uh, has beneath it a mind-body unity, a, um, a dualism. 
you're saying to me, how can your mind control your body? And I'm saying it's not one thing. It's not that you do this and that affects that and that it's all happening virtually simultaneously. And that's the piece. You know, my colleagues, the first time I spoke about some of this work, what's going on under the hood? I said, well, surely something is going on, but it's not it's not causally related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I tend to. Yeah, I, I think for sure. I mean, that, especially this gives because, us, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but this gives us so much control over our health um, that um, it, it's mind blowing. And that part of the um, where you were going before with the mind body dualism and, you know, some things just feel impossible. And so when you're tired, for instance, um, it's hard for you while you're being tired to think your psychology has anything to do with it. So you have lots of studies on fatigue. And let me give you an example, uh, you know, a simple thing. So we ask um, people to do 100 jumping jacks and tell us when they're tired. They get tired at 70. We ask another group of people to do 200 jumping jacks. Tell us when you get tired. They get tired at 140. Right. Context plays a very large role on our, our physical makeup. Now, so I teach Harvard students, right? Very smart. And so I ask them the question, how far is it humanly possible to run? So they know that I wouldn't ask them if it were 26 miles of a marathon, right? So then it's almost like it's an auction. And one person says, you know, 30, and the next person says 35. And they, they get up as far as 50, and then they stop. And then I play them a video of the Tariamora, which are a tribe in Copper Canyon in Mexico. And these people, by and large, run 250 miles without stopping. That's wow. grossly different, right? Yeah. Well, as soon as, you know, so we think it can't be, it can't be because it hasn't been. And then as soon as somebody does the impossible so that it becomes possible, then people often act as if we always knew it. And what I'm saying is we never know. We can't know how long it's humanly possible to live. You know, I mean, if you said it, okay, uh, you might say 125, okay? Um, does that mean that if somebody were 125 and wanted to live for another week, you wouldn't think it would be possible? Right. You know, another month. And, you know, it, um, and I don't think it's useful to set limits on ourselves. Yeah, I think it that it reminds uh, me it reminds me of um, of certain types of achievements, for example. So, you know, you see uh, in the world of skateboarding, for example, um, when you you don't see a linear increase in yeah. certain types of high risk, difficult skills. Oh, and, when, and with respect to virtually anything, yeah. the relationship is not a straight line. There's always, you know, maybe three steps forward, one step back or two steps back. And so, well, on. right. Yeah. And then, and you also see uh, this pattern where if, it, where no one is being able to do this one trick and then one performer will get it on video and then everybody all could, exactly kinds of other people exactly. are doing it a year later yeah, and it, yeah. to your point it kind of suggests that there's this very artificial ceiling Limit that, that we, we can impose. put and, yeah. and 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 could you talk a little bit more about like uh, you know you talk about labels and you talk about framing how you frame different aspects of life well, could you it's talk fine about that? it's fine you know being mindful is creating categories being mindless is getting trapped by those categories and so what we need to understand is that you know you you can create the category and then you can reshuffle the deck and create a different if we took 20 people and i said put them into two categories you might have men and women okay put them in the put them back together now uh, give me another way of understanding oh they have blue eyes and brown eyes put them together we have a lot of hair no hair blonde hair brown hair, you know, and so on that there are so many different avenues open to us but when we do it mindlessly we act as if these categories were somehow handed down from the heavens and, you know, and then we just get stuck in it. Most people take the world as it's given, as if that's the way it has to be. And it just doesn't occur to them to change it. It's not that if you said, could you change it? They wouldn't say yes. It, you just, it is what it is. So let's say um, uh, you live in a house and you're six, five, and you're living with somebody who's four, eight. You're both using the same toilet. 
One of you are not getting your needs met. It wouldn't occur to people to make it so it meets both of their needs. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? You know, Mm -hmm. somebody has decided how things should be, and most people just go along with that. And um, I'm here to tell people everything is mutable. Everything can be changed. And if it doesn't meet your needs, you should change it. So, for example, and if you can't change it, you should recognize that it's just, you know, not by chance so much, but by somebody's bias that it ended up this way versus that. So I'm a tennis player, very Mm -hmm. average, good average though. Okay. And I go to serve, I play doubles. I throw the ball up, I kill it, doesn't go in. Now I have my backup wuss serve that always goes in and they always return it, all right? If I wrote the rules, we'd have three serves, maybe even four. So the first one, I kill it. It doesn't go in. The second one, I kill it again. Now I'm even better. The third one, now I've really got it. And I can still have the backup. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just because whoever wrote the rules didn't need those extra serves, I'm a less good tennis player than I might otherwise be. So Mm -hmm. actually, if you came here and we were going to play tennis, we'd probably play with three serves. Why not? Okay. Now I understand that we need to have, if we're all going to gather for some professional sport, we need to agree on what the rules are. I'm not arguing against that. What I'm trying to make people aware of is that everything that they experience was somebody's decision about how it should be. Mm -hmm. And so if it doesn't work for you, change it. And what goes along with that, Ryan, is that the more different you are from the person who wrote the rule, the more important it is for you to do it your own way. Now, do you uh, do you reject the idea that in order to engage in this sort of what I would say, like a more advanced, a higher level of thinking, do you reject the idea that these ways of thinking require resources and time no no in fact uh you had mentioned system one system two and i told you then to reiterate that mindfulness is energy begetting it's not energy consuming it's what you're doing when you're having a great time right you know so you're watching a comedian and you're laughing your head off comedy is only funny when you expect it to go this way but it went that way and then you laugh oh how silly am i for not having realized that Um, I think that people should be mindful all the time. But what happens is that because they have a misunderstanding of what mindfulness is, oh, my, they shudder, oh, my God, they confuse it with thinking. And thinking has gotten a bad rap. You know, thinking is fun. What's not fun is the way people think, which is half worrying about, are they going to get the right answer? And, and, you know, um, when you were talking about or we're talking about redesigning the games and so on, what people need to understand is that while people can change and you can run the mile and this amount and less and less and less, that we really don't want a life of a hundred percent success. Mm-hmm. We think we do, you know, um, but if we do you uh, let me illustrate this um well you i mean that's actually we're life. learning that's uh, i mean by definition yes. by definition exactly. that's that exactly is exactly right has, failure has to happen in order to learn if your brain no, uh, but you shouldn't see it as failure. everything that's happening then yeah. you don't see you know, it as failure it's a step along the way but where i was right. going was different so let's say i play golf uh, badly, <laughs> as good as my intermediate tennis. And I learn, and now I get a hole in one every single time I uh, swing that club. Well, there's no game left anymore, right? So yeah. it turns out you can do things either perfectly mindlessly or imperfectly mindfully. And so what we need to do is not, oh, I wish I could figure this out completely, you know, to get into the fun. Um, and the challenge of whatever it is we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the world has just been set up in the wrong way. I don't know, you know. Well, so could you you talk a little bit more about about the barriers that people put up? You know, what, what what are some of the thoughts that people have that they cling to that prevent them Yeah, well, one of the things, okay, so there's so many. Um, uh, One is that they're supposed to know, even before you start to do it, 
you know, that you're supposed to have mastered this thing, um, that there are right answers independent of context. So if you don't know the right answer, then you pretend and you avoid the situation entirely because you're afraid of looking stupid. Um, right. And um, people mistakenly think that the way to be is confident and certain, but certainty is mindless. And the way to be in this world, to be most effective, I believe, is to be confident and uncertain. And when you're aware you don't know, everything is potentially interesting. Uh, when you're mindful, you're no longer judging people negatively because you understand that behavior made sense from their perspective or else they wouldn't do it. And, you know, when you're not judging other people negatively, you tend not to think that they're judging you negatively. And so you, then you worry less about um, how you're going to be seen. Um, when you're um, when you're mindful and uh, mindless and buy into a lot of the things that the culture gives us, you have a sense of uh, people being successful or, or not successful without paying attention to, well, who decided what the measure of success is? You know, I had this experience that was it was just eye opening for me. So. You know, I have all of these Distinguished Scientist Awards and Genius Award, and, which is relevant to this story. So we're having a tremendous amount of furniture being delivered for reasons not worth going into, and it's going to be stored in the basement. I see the amount of furniture. I know the size of the basement. And I, in all my genius, think there is no way that that furniture is going to fit there. Now, there's a person who is working here who sees himself as just terrible. He's got nothing going for him, according to him. He has no education, you know, that um, he feels like a loser. Okay. He manages to get every piece of furniture in that small space, not only get it in there, but that you can uh, have access to each piece and still get around. It's not fair. You know, this way it struck me that people would assume I know everything, that he knows nothing. And there's stress for those of us who are supposed to know and depression for those who are thought not to know. When everybody doesn't know something, everybody knows something else. Everybody can't do something. Everybody can do something else. And that our, our view of the world as winners and losers is what I think, and being afraid of being put in that category of losers is what keeps us from, it keeps us sealed in an unlived life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the good things in life are not zero sum. It's not, if you have it, then there's less for me to have. And uh, so, so many things need to be reorganized. But, but most of the stuff in this book are just sort of, first, there's all the health work. And this considerable amount of that saying, yeah, gee, can, let's let's jump into the into the, you know, the, the bulk of the book, which focuses on health. And I have to say, my I think my favorite connection uh, had to do with fatigue. And you kind of already mentioned one of those studies. But this idea of of we kind of think fatigue is something that we physiological. Have. Yeah, no, yeah. we think it's physiological. Right. We think addiction is physiological. And what I'm saying here is physiological and psychological. It's all one thing. Right. And, um, you know, so this is a wonderful study. It wasn't done by me, by Frank Beach many years ago in the 50s. I love this. And all the men that are listening will enjoy it. So if you take a little boy rat and you put it, introduce a little girl rat, they'll copulate until the little boy rat can't take it anymore. He needs a refractory period. However, if instead of giving him that time to rest and regain his strength, you immediately introduce another little girl rat, he's ready to go right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that and what I'm trying to explain to people is that fatigue is largely, if not exclusively, context dependent, and we can control the context. You know, people don't realize that. Uh, social psychologists have said for forever that your behavior is context um, dependent. You know, you whisper in libraries, you stand on, on the bleachers and cheering at football games. Um, but there's nothing out there that makes this happen. You know, we, we get taught this and we do it. But you can always impose a different context that will help free you. So um, I have 14 thoughts at once. Let me, I don't, 
let me well, just... so you also uh, you also see it with anxiety right i mean anxiety's anxiety never been, it's never been higher in in younger populations yeah it and, and it seems as though uh you know perhaps your book offer you know you're trying to kind of dig into the extent to which anxiety is much like fatigue is it something that our body yeah, is no, doing anxiety, or is there something that that we sure. can intervene with Sure. Stress, anxiety are a function of the view you take of an event, not of the event. Um, at, for all emotions, you know, when you say you made me angry, nobody is making you anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could imagine some little kid saying that same thing to you, chances are you wouldn't get angry. Right. And that thing said uh, to many people by the same sayer wouldn't lead all of us to be angry. So we have choices about our emotions, but about stress and anxiety, the culture teaches, um, you know, stress is just a part of life and work is stressful. And, you know, so just get on with it. And I think that, that that's simply wrong. I think that there are ways to uh, radically diminish the amount of, of stress that you have um, by recognizing that almost Everything you do can be done so that it's interesting or fun, you know, and that um, um, events that seem scary and bad um, have another view available where actually you could welcome it. You know, you're afraid you're going to lose your job. <clears throat> well, I'm you know, sure that would be scary and stressful. But I think if you're working someplace for 40 hours a week minimum, um, and you don't feel valued and you're worried about losing your job, the best thing in the world for you would be to lose that job mm -hmm. and then to reorganize yourself and find something else to do. And in today's world, there are actually lots of jobs available. Um, it but, sounds like what you're people, saying is it, it, it overlaps with uh, with the work looking at optimism, right? Uh, yeah. The, trying to see the best possible outcome. Well, in it's any not, given yeah, situation. but you have to realize that both optimists and pessimists think they're realists, right? Mm -hmm. The optimist doesn't say, oh, it's negative, but hey, what the hell, I'm going to see it as positive. <clears throat> Nor does the pessimist say, well, this is probably good, but I prefer seeing it as awful. They see what they see and think that that's the way it is. Right. When you're mindful, <clears throat> you're not seeing it as positive or negative. It can be anything. And it's so the, then, it's the openness and the willingness right, yeah, right. to see and the so new then, things. Right. right. And so when you see it in all these different ways, then you can choose which way you want to see it. And so you want to be miserable, see it that way. You want to feel good, see it this other way. Or, or don't evaluate it at all, just be. So I, I have to play devil's advocate for a second because this, this thought, I have this thought m multiple times a day, which is, isn't it more likely that when we look at people that embody this sort of method of thinking, this mindfulness that you are describing, that it's not so much that they've worked to get there, but that they don't have the noise, the mental distractions, the inner monologue that others do and that the reason why a lot of people don't end up getting into this mindful state is because they have thoughts just 90 miles an now, hour that's very good ryan but what i'm talking about is the way to turn the radio off you know to to make it so uh you don't have good thoughts bad thoughts you know that you're not obsessing um all you are is noticing and in this openness you're able to take advantage of opportunities to which other people would be blind and you get to avert the danger not yet arisen, you know, simply by questioning <clears throat> some of the things you've just taken for granted. So, for example, to be stressed, two things have to happen the, or anxious. The first is you have to um, predict an event is going to occur. Second, that when it occurs, it's going to be awful. Well, there are two parts to that, and you could attack both parts. So the first relies on uh, an assumption that you can predict. And this is another one of these things that we all got, got wrong, and we've been taught uh, incorrectly. Prediction is an illusion. Now, <clears throat> the greatest um, 
mathematicians, statisticians will tell you, uh, no matter how they're buried in numbers, that you can never predict the individual event. Even right. if we take something strange. So, you know, um, Michael Jordan and I are going to have a foul shooting contest. Okay. And we're only going to shoot one basket. Don't be so sure he's going to win. On occasion, he misses. And on occasion, I make it. Right. You know, if we were to uh, do it over 50 shots, of course, he would win. Or if we had 50 people you know, doing whatever it is, um, it's a different response. But we can't predict the individual case. So if you think you can, I, I'll make you a wager. We'll go to a Mercedes dealership. Wow, Mercedes, fine car. And so let's say there are 100 cars there. And I say to you, OK, we're going to pick one of these cars at random. And you're going to start it up. And if it starts right away, you won. If it doesn't start right away, you have to give me your life savings. People are not going to do it because on some level, you know, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Even the best of us make mistakes. Even the best creations sometimes turn out to be you know, lemons or whatever. All right. So and that's when you're where you're dealing with large numbers and the individual. We don't know. We're going to be able to finish this interview. Is my dog going to get into some problem where we're going to have to leave and go rescue him? Um, is the Internet going to go out? Mm -hmm. um, is somebody coming through that door and do whatever they're going to do to you? Yeah. Say something positive. We just don't know. We think we know because we're so good at looking back. And thinking that, ah, oh, of course. So an example I've used too often, but let's say you see John and Jane fighting at a party. Okay, and you're at that party too. And if I said to you right at that moment, hey, Ryan, you think John and Jane are going to get divorced? You say, what are you talking about? People fight. But right. let's say I, I didn't ask that of you. And now two weeks later, you find out John and Jane are getting, oh, I knew it. You should have seen right. them go with each other at the party. All right. So prediction is an illusion. Now, how do you deal with that to become less stressed? Well, um, if this event that you're trying to predict, that you're acting as if it's going to happen, give yourself three, five reasons why it won't happen. And you immediately feel better. But the harder, more fun part is let's imagine it does happen. How is that actually an advantage? And there are always advantages if you stop and think about it. So you went from this awful thing is definitely going to happen to this thing may or may not happen. And if it happens, it's fine, because no matter what happens, there's a way of understanding things so that you can find yourself in a positive place. So uh, do you feel like let's let's go back to talk about mindlessness for a moment. Yeah. If you if you're advocating for specifically approaching all situations with this uh, openness, openness to openness to seeing things differently are is there a place for m mindlessness where we're, where we're not no. critically no. examining the situation no, you don't have to be crit no no okay let me let me i should have done this in print because i've written so many books on all of this and for so many years um to make clearer I'm not, you can't be mindful of everything all of the time. I'm, I'm going to pay attention to what you're saying. So, you know, I have things on the desk here. I'm not attending to them and so on. But you want to never, never think you know something so well that it doesn't require any attention. All right. That so that, sense, yeah. okay. And so you want to never be mindless. Now, um, then people say, well, but being mindless, surely there's got to be some advantage. I said, no, the only advantage is that it maintains the status quo. So if you're sitting on top, you know, all those people beneath you think, you know, things that you don't know that the way things are, are the only ways it can be and so on. I use an example. You're in a park with a two year old. And, you know, so you say to me, let's say the two year old wanders into the street. Wouldn't it be better to mindlessly just grab the child from the street? I say, no. First of all, if you were mindful, the two year old wouldn't have gotten in the street in the first place. Secondly, when you're going to grab the child, it's so much better to have, uh, you know, uh, notice which way the car is actually turning. 
because you want to pull the child out of harm's way, not unintentionally into harm's way. And behind all of that is the mistaken notion that mindfulness is faster and mindlessness is faster. And um, if you learned it mindlessly and took a long time in doing it, you know, not necessarily, right? If you're doing something in 10 steps that mindfully I see could be one step, then my mindfulness is faster. But it's also, if we go, you know, the way most people are thinking, it may possibly be nanoseconds faster. Um, and when does that really matter? So how do we transition from mindlessness to mindfulness? Because yeah, that's the, the way that I've heard you talking about it and, and sort of how it's presented in the book uh, you make the case that it's a perspective shift. It is a mm -hmm. don't think of it this way. Think of it that way. Um, but if it were that simple, m more people would do it. There wouldn't even be a well, self-help no, no, industry. And that's right? a, no, yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> that's a very good point. Why are so many people mindless? And for one thing, it's, uh, as I said, I think it maintains the status quo. So some people are getting rich. All right. Um, it's very hard if you go through school and everybody is telling you one and one is two, horses don't eat meat. They're giving you absolute facts. You're living your life as if these things are true in some absolute sense to immediately undo that. Okay. So I agree with you. It's not boom. It all changes. However, if you, first of all, to learn anything new, you should now learn it mindfully, which means that maybe it depends. It would seem rather than it is because nothing is. Okay. Um, now, um, so how do you undo all of these years of mindlessness? And that's what my book on becoming an artist is about. We don't have time to go through all of it. Now, let, let's just say when you find yourself miserable. So if you're walking and you, you know, walk into a mannequin and you say, excuse me, it, nobody's being hurt by that. All right. So a certain amount of your mindlessness is just going to be. However, um, much of our mindlessness becomes noticeable to us because we're miserable. We're depressed. We're sick. Um, we're anxious and so on. And at those moments, since we're talking to ourselves anyway, I'm suggesting we just talk to ourselves differently. Now, what people don't understand is most people engage in what's called hypothesis confirming data searches. And, you know, it's a seek and you shall find. It doesn't matter what you're looking for. You're going to find evidence. So if you're looking for how am I miserable, you're going to find lots of evidence for how you're miserable. So I suggest you ask yourself, how are you wonderful? You're going right. to find evidence for that also. And then realize that you're neither wonderful nor miserable. <laughs> you know that. Um, and what you were a moment ago doesn't doesn't mean that's how you're going to be going forward. Um so when there's something that uh, you feel knocked on the ground, this is the way to pick yourself up. But as you go through the day and just intentionally notice new things about the person you're living with, if you're living with anybody, ask yourself, how might I do my job a little differently? You know, I just gave the pro sem yesterday at Harvard. This is for the first year graduate students. And they had the whole thing planned out. And um, because I live what I speak, um, I said, well, OK, uh, we can do that. But can we start with what I want to start with? <laughs> How are they going to say no? Right. I'm the <laughs> professor who's there. To, and, you know, and then the whole thing went in a whole uh, an entirely different direction. As soon as we realize that everything that is was at one time a decision, which means it could have been otherwise. It means everything can be changed, but you're not going to change it unless you recognize um, that it's not working for you. And, um, you know, I, I have part of the book revealing lots of the language we use that suggests to me that we're living a life that is not just our physical health, but that is so, so much less than it could be. You know, we have people who give up. And so then psychologists and friends, um, relatives try to teach them, well, just try to do it. And try sounds good, right? It's much better than giving up. But 
Would you try to eat an ice cream cone? No. So right. trying has built into it failure. So we do some studies where we have one group try it, one group do it, and the doing group always outperforms the trying group. Mm -hmm. Another one of these things that people, I have so many of these in the book, every time I come up with one, I get excited, um, you know, about hope. Isn't hope wonderful? No, hope is better than being hopeless. But hope also has built into it an expectation for failure. You don't go to the kitchen for a cup of coffee, hoping that the coffee will be there. You expect that it's good. So here's one that is really strange. I was asked by uh, one of the Harvard churches uh, to give a sermon many years ago. I'm not religious, right? I, I say yes because I'm a yes sayer. Now, what am I going to talk about? I have no idea. Then all of a sudden, okay, I'll talk about forgiveness. It's not religious, but it sounds kind of religious, and I can get by with that. Well, I start thinking about it, and it's mind-blowing to me. I come up with something that's actually sacrilegious. Okay, so here it goes in a nutshell. If you ask 10 people, is forgiveness good or bad, what are they going to tell you? It's, it's good. good, of course. Right. Yeah. If you ask 10 people, is blame good or bad, what are they going to tell you? That's bad. But, you know, you can't forgive unless you first blame. Ah, forgivers are our blamers. Now, do you blame people for good things or bad things? You blame people for bad things, but things in themselves are neither good nor bad. So what do we have here? We have people who see the world negatively, who blame, who then forgive. And I think that's hardly divine. Now, of course, once you blame, you're better off forgiving than not. But there's a whole other way of being. I don't want anyone to ever forgive me because everything I do makes sense from my perspective or else I wouldn't do it. So I want you to understand me. And when you understand, that obviates the necessity for forgiveness. One in the medical world that's similar to this is um, you had cancer and now the cancer is in remission or is it cured? Now, um, remission is not as good, I mean, is better than having the act of cancer. But let me go back a few steps. So a friend of mine had terrible, terrible cancer, um, an unusual kind of cancer. And I had just seen her and she just got back to, my cancer's in remission. I said, wonderful. And then wait a second. If I had the very same tests, presumably they tell me I don't have cancer. Why is it I don't have it, but she has it in remission? You know, when you have a cold and the cold is gone, you don't say it's in remission, you're cured, mm -hmm. right? In some way, it might be lurking there. It's very different. You know, when you see yourself as cured, you go about living, you become more mindful, you're, you're becoming stronger and stronger. When you see yourself in remission, you're stressed, waiting for this thing to possibly return. So we took women who are on a breast cancer awareness walk, and we simply asked them, these are people who had cancer in the past, did they see their cancer as in remission or are they cured? And then we checked back in six months later, and those who saw themselves as cured were happier and healthier in every measure we took. Remission makes you stressed. Stress is terrible for your health. But stress, as we've said now many times, is a psychological concept. You don't have to be stressed. And whatever the medical world tells you, and they do their best, you have to recognize is based on research that only gives us probabilities, right. best guesses. And we shouldn't react to that information as if it's absolute any more than one and one is two. So for a lot of people, cholesterol um, is related to cholesterol level you know, bad levels of cholesterol related to heart problems. Certainly not for everybody. You know, whatever it is you have, we don't know if it's going to go the way of the norm or are you going to be different? And by uh, understanding that you don't give up hope um, and um, you just organize yourself differently. You know, people now are living very long lives. Not everybody, but there's some strange things that happen. Yeah, so that, I, I did want in oh, closing, oh. in closing, I did want you to talk about aging in particular. Okay. And how because it seems as though there's some 
very interesting applications of mindfulness. You know, people get older, they, they, they have a tendency to have these thoughts of I'm yeah. not the same person I used to be. Yeah, um, but again, one of the strongest norms, yeah. the strongest expectations we have is what happens when we age. So, well, when you get yeah. when you get older, you can see yourself as the same as you've always been, or you can see yourself as different. You don't have to be older, Ryan. You at your age, you know, have you changed in the last ten years? Are you the same? Well, if you look for the ways you're the same, you're going to conclude I'm the same old guy. Um, right. And if you want to look at the way you're different, you're going to notice the differences. We can, again, find evidence for whatever hypothesis we have. People want to live long, healthy lives. And so they do what they can to add more uh, years to their life. And I believe that what we should do is add more life to our years. And that that will probably have the effect of adding more years to our lives. Um, and that to be older, you know, uh, okay, years ago, I noticed that when you're young, you're developing. And then all of a sudden, you start aging. You know, it, it's not fair. It's not true. There are so many things that I can do now that I couldn't do when I was younger. Uh, that I value. And if you said you could turn the clock back and make me 20 again, no, I don't want it you know, um, that I value all that I've learned, all the experience that has made me a, a healthier, bigger person uh, at this point in my life. Um, but what happens is if we only look for loss, we're going to find it. And that even something like memory, you know, um, I, I meet a lot of people, right? I'm a teacher, all these students, you know, somebody will tell me their name, and two minutes later, I don't remember their name. It wasn't that I forgot it. I didn't learn it in the first place. And so a lot of the memory loss is because our values have changed. We don't care about the same things that we used to care about. And, you know, yes, you might be a little slower on the tennis court, but you should also, you're probably also a little wiser. And, you know, I played tennis a while back with these 17 year old boys, wonderful athletes, but they didn't know what they were doing. And, you know, I, I, and I knew what I was doing and uh, without having to expend the energy that they were expending. So you do things a little differently. So what? Um, I think that um, people are living longer and the effect of the, the healthy, happy part of our lives is what we should be extending. And one way to extend it are to do some of the things I talk about in this book um, about controlling our health uh, with our thoughts. We focus now mostly on stress, but um, it's not it's not just a matter of stress. You know that one of the things that we have when when you have a chronic illness, most people believe um, these symptoms are going to get worse or stay the same. Nothing moves in only one direction, right? Sometimes there are little blips where it's a little better. So let's say, and same thing with stress. People who are stressed think they're stressed all, nobody is stressed all the time, right? right? But the, the thing is that when you're really stressed, you know, and then you're all consumed with your stress, then if you're not stressed, you're not thinking about it anymore. And so then you're stressed again, you forget that intervening part that was fine. But if I call you throughout the day, at random times. And I say, Ryan, how stressed are you now? And are you more or less stressed than the last time I called? And we do this enough times, you're going to see that, gee, you're not maximally stressed all the time. So that feels good. Now, this process, um, after you see that change, and I say, well, why are you less stressed now? Um, or even more stressed now, you do a mindful search uh, why now? Have I walked differently? Have I eaten differently? Am I standing more, you know, being friendlier, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. And that mindful search itself is good for your health. And I believe if we look for a solution, we're more likely to find one. Well, so it turns out that we've done this with people who have multiple sclerosis, people who have Parkinson's, uh, chronic pain, big things. And in each case, we get a dramatic reduction in their symptoms just by this act of noticing. Well, that is incredible to know. If you want to learn more about the research uh, behind uh, Ellen's uh, definition of mindfulness and mind-body uh, unity, uh, check out her book. It is called The Mindful Body. Uh, it has been a treat to, to talk to you. Thank you so much for being on.
This has been my pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. Stay well. For more on Ellen, visit ellenlanger.me. That's E-L-L-E-N-L-A-N-G-E-R dot M-E. Or pick up her book, The Mindful Body, wherever books are sold. If you enjoy this podcast, please share an episode with two of your friends. Follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or X, formerly known as Twitter, at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me with comments or guest suggestions at why do we do that podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question, why do we do that? <laughs>